If everyone wants to come in and find their seats and get settled again, we will get started. Our first guest speaker has many distinctions and accomplishments. He's a Rhodes Scholar, he led Bell Canada, McKinsey here in Canada, and was former CFO of Google during its massive growth phase. And so as you can see, leading world-class organizations through countless digital transformation initiatives. He served on the board of Bombardier, is on the board of Twitter and Lightspeed, and among many other companies. He's championed investors and advisors, so he knows what it takes for companies and individuals to endure. To speak to his experience and some of the lessons that he's learned along the way, please welcome to the stage general partner of Inovia Capital, Patrick Bichette, alongside Dan Sachs. Thank you. Okay, this is really fun for me because Patrick's probably one of the most fun people I have conversations with. We're going to talk about the how we met story. Um, sure. So I get introduced to Patrick. I think it was a cold email. And I was like, look, here's the, 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 the CFO of Google re reaching out and saying, hey, can we chat? I want to learn. Um, and uh, can, we, can we talk about that, sure. that moment? Uh, yeah, we were, I was just in between jobs. Uh, and I was talking to Dan and I was telling him, he was so, where are you at? So I was basically explaining to him, look, it's pretty simple. I'm going to, imagine I'm going to die at 100. I'm at 50, so I'm halfway there. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't really control the first 15 years because you, your parents tell you what to do. And so now, and then you know, the last 10 years, you're kind of like wearing diapers and eating porridge with no teeth. So that doesn't count. <laughs> so that leaves you about 40. So it was about, okay, so now what? So that was the question that we were debating. And I was telling him, you know what, I think that, uh, this is a good time to come back to Canada and do a, a bit of work here. So that's how we actually met, and I was super interested in about. And I'm After thrilled you came back to join Inovia Capital. Uh, Chris and the team have been such big supporters of AppDirect from the beginning, but the fact that we have Patrick and Dennis Klobelman as well who have been mentors and leaders, it means so much. Um, so obviously you grew up here in Quebec, and uh, did you ever dream you'd be on the leadership team of one of the fastest growing <laughs> companies in history? Yeah, from Montreal North, uh, you know, it was the first, first thing I thought when, my, when I was six years old. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll be, uh, <laughs> not at all. I mean, I, I, I'm this kind of absolute uh, rags to riches in terms of opportunities story, like you never hear them. Grew up in Montreal North, really loving parents, super simple family. First person in my family to go to university. I was a terrible student. Um, I hated school all my life. I still do. I think it just it's <laughs> it's just like if I'm I'm just hyperactive kid before Ritalin was invented. So I was terrorizing. I was always at the principal's office, like everything was super slow. And um, and then you know you finally f finish Sijep. I did Katimovic. I did like one year of community work across Canada, then I became a logger, and then I became a tree planter, and then I moved around. Then I, I decided, okay, I need a university degree because I really people won't think I'm an idiot. So I did my so I did two degrees in four and a half years, got it out of the way, and, uh, and then just got onto the bandwagon of corporate life. And then I just, I'm a workaholic. I'm a hyperactive kid, so I basically work seven days a week all the time. It was fantastic. We had a great time. And then one day I got a phone call <laughs> from a good friend of mine who, if you want to hear a crazy story, I was her coach on the women's ice hockey team at Oxford. And so Shona and I spent endless hours in vans driving around Britain because I was the coach of the, she was the captain of the team, Canadian. And then she just phoned me and said, we're looking for CFO. I think you should come and have a coffee. And that's how I ended up with the gig. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so so the, the six-year-old Patrick was definitely uh, not expecting the, the let's go. I was not expecting that at all. Okay. So you just said work seven days, workaholic. But I know what happened the last two and a half years. Um, do you consider that work? Tell, tell everyone what you've been up to. So I left Google in mid-15, and then I, but I stayed an advisor for a year and a half, so I was basically on call all the time. And my wife and I, we basically, so I'm in the phase, I told you I'm kind of 59, I was 53. Um, my wife basically kind of sat me down and said, buddy, time to chill a bit. The kids are all out of the house, right? We have no cats, no dogs. We have a cactus in the living room. We can go. Like, you have enough money. Like, let's do something different. So I said, okay, fine, cool. 
So I basically went to see Larry and Sergey, and I said, okay, guys, I just need a break. And uh, they said, okay, well, I'll take a month off. Or I said, no, no, I need like a break. <laughs> and uh, they said, oh, okay. So they let me, um, we took six months to find my replacement. And then I said, I'm on call because it's not like I'm going to work. So for two and a half years, we've been on the road. We basically bought hiking boots, backpacks, and I told my wife, okay, you build the list. So I did two things. I said, you build the list, whatever you want to do, we're doing now. And it's our time. And, and then to my kids, my three young adults, so my kids have left home, they're all in university or working. I basically sent them the challenge. I said, here's the gig. Any adventure in the world, as long as you're willing to do it with dad, I'll pay for it, try me. I do not recommend that strategy. <laughs> <laughs> we've done three half Ironmans. We've done a full Ironman. We've done multiple marathons. They dragged my ass on the walls of Yosemite. I had to learn to rock climb, Antarctica, Everest Base Camp, the Dolomites, the West Highland Way, uh, Mont Blanc. It was a absolute phenomenal time. So two and a half years on the road. Would come back every kind of 10 weeks or 12 weeks, do laundry, check the pile of mail, and then figure out the next thing and go again. So that was pretty cool. So you clearly know how to endure. Yes, I know how to endure. <laughs> okay, so let's start talking about digital endurance. Um, so, you know, and after X, we've really studied and looked at what the secret sauce is for businesses to digitally endure. And also spent a lot of time thinking about how companies that may have been, you know, deep-rooted for many years, large incumbent enterprises, how they can digitally transform. Yeah. And obviously you have the contrast of, you know, being a leader at Bell Canada and then going over to Google. Um, so let's just touch on some of the differences. Um, but when you join Bell, maybe explain the state of the, the business at the time and the transformations that took place uh, in that era. So when I, I joined Bell in about 2000, roughly 2000, and um, for eight years, uh, we basically had to turn around the place completely. Uh, there, was, there was actually two fundamental profound changes at the time at Bell. The first one was mobile, and the second one was data. Mobile was easy because it was a new world. So you just add on, it's all new revenue, it's all, so you just add on a completely new set of infrastructure, new sets of equipment, new sets of services. It was this all kind of pure oxygen benefit. The data world was a completely different story because now, you know, we had this company that had this distributed plant of copper that had to figure out a way to survive the migration to data because voice was going to die. And not only that, but for the first time in its life, it had a competitive threat because the cable plant was much better suited for high-speed data than um, the typical copper plant that we had. So we had a huge, huge transformation to do on that front. Got it. And what was the philosophy? So right now, a lot of our, uh, you know, people in the, in the audience right here are thinking through, how do I drive meaningful change within my organization? Now, many of their businesses are built off massive legacy revenue bases on old systems. How do you balance, you know, maintaining risk of the revenue there versus saying we're going to rip and replace or transform completely? I think that you have to recognize that if you don't rip and replace, if you don't use a Band-Aid strategy, you will die. You will basically, you'll always live, right? I mean, AT&T continues to live today and it still has some meaningful portion of um, long distance revenue. That's legacy, that's all 90% margin. But the reality is it had to transform itself completely. If it had only stayed to its core, it would have died. So you have to move super fast. And the issue that you have with a big infrastructure like Bell is you have huge challenges in doing it, but you need immense courage to actually push through a ton of change super fast. Think of us at Bell, we had th four core challenges. One is you have a mindset of a company that lives on 5.9 reliability, right? So you're allowed 16 minutes of downtime a year. And that's the mind, like everything in the fiber of the culture of the places, you never go down because you're Bell. You're, you're, you, that's the way the place works. And now you have to completely take risks. You have to go to bleeding edge technology because everything's inventing as you go. Um, so now that's a huge problem. The second huge problem was the, data, the plant itself was not really suited. So you have to basically upgrade the entire plant. So physically it's a huge engineering feat. And then finally, 
We had union agreements from 1974. The fax machine was not even invented. Like mothers stayed at home so that when the bell guy showed up, right? I mean, this is 1974, right? And so when you call somebody on the weekend, it's triple time and a half on a calling list if they feel like they want to come in because it's 1974. And you have to rip out entire union agreements in a span of months. And you have to do all these things simultaneously Tootsie Roll. So it was a great job. I, again, seven days a week. Uh. I remember, uh, I, I can tell you, I remember being on, my, on nine, what was it, two thou 2007. Remember the winter of 30 feet of snow in front of your house if you're from Montreal? <laughs> it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm with my sh I got home at, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night. I get this, f I, I, I talk to my wife. She says, oh, by the way, the insurance company says that unless we clear our roof, and our windows, they won't insure us because you can't get out of the house. So, okay, you have dinner and then you take your shovel and now you go to the roof because your kids are sleeping upstairs and you think that's not a good idea so if there's a fire in the house. And sure enough, right at midnight, I remember I'm with my shovel on the roof of the house and I'm kind of digging out these windows and my phone rings because we're in the middle of negotiations with the union guy. And so you just sit in the snowbank <laughs> and you look at the stars and you're talking on the phone. <laughs> I mean, that's changed. <laughs> I mean, <did> you, <laughs> <laughs> where people will say, you know, what's changed, that's changed. That's, that's a, a big change. And for many of the people in the room, they're the innovators, the risk takers, the people who want to transform their business, but they go back and it's tough. And, you know, people sitting in your spot, the CFO role, oftentimes I hear are the detractors. You can't get the budget passed. Um, you know, one of the things that we look at in the data is that amazing trend lines in the first year or two of, uh, of, a, of a new initiative that we work on with our clients can just get killed even though the traction is there. What advice would you give to, yeah, to everyone here? I would argue that that was one of the biggest mistakes. No, it's not a mistake. It was a lost opportunity. If Bell had been smart in two when I was there during, my, so if you think of the learnings I've had, we would have been so much smarter to work with the entire ecosystem of startups give them access to our network, and be patient. The problem with big companies is the top leadership, because you have so much pressure from the street and from your earnings and from, y you just say, I can't afford it, because now it's another 20 million or it's another six million or it's another investment and, and it's gonna kill my EPS growth and now I'm gonna take a bath. And if you're a real leader, you gotta put that aside. You gotta tie yourself with this new generation of up and coming startups you have to actually give them access to your data and your plant on some form of deal basis. You can take equity in these things and you have to be patient. And if they're working, but they're tiny, they will be big one day. If the time is there, they will follow. And so that's where I find big companies usually fumble is they will, they'll try it for 18 months. They have good data points, but it's too small. It's inconsequential. So, ah, and then they, and then you have a reorg and then everybody says, oh, what was the idea? What's that? And then they kind of stop this thing. Then they start another one. That's where, large companies are not patient enough. If you're in a large company in this audience, you have to stick with it. Startups stick with it because they have to survive. You have to stick with it because they're your next billion dollar opportunity. So I see a ton of nodding heads in, in, the, in the room. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you don't live that. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, th but that being said, um, a large company is you know, maybe a, a 30, 100,000, 200,000 people. Um, the people here representing those companies, one person. How do they drive that change? How do they get the support of leadership um, to make sure that, you know, like you said, it, we need to persist beyond the 18 months? It is, look, it, it's absolutely critical to have um, top management support. If you don't have a, a strategy that supports it, and if you don't have a C, I always say, look, I, I had these two sentences. When I in my previous life, if you think of all of my time at uh, McKinsey and Company, there's only two sentences I remember from McKinsey days. Your industry is your destiny. So you can be as an idiot as you want. If you're in a pharma, you can make 40% margin. And you can be a Nobel Prize winner. If you're in mining, you're gonna grind it. Your industry is your destiny. And the second one is your CEO is your culture. Whether you like it or not, because of these pyramids, if you have the wrong CEO that doesn't have the courage, go find another job or figure out a way to change CEO. But, 
I said, I, I've never watched Games of Thrones, but I hear it's got that kind of thing. <laughs> um, I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I've heard there's a lot of deaths in it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the CEO is the culture. And if you don't have a patient CEO who's willing to invest and willing, if she or he is not willing to take the bet to say, against all odds, I am nurturing this thing, I mean, you're up for a rough ride. That is absolutely critical. And if you have one, then it's great because you can put on the jets and then you can am do amazing things. So that is a key ingredient. So I'm going to put you on the spot. So if there's, you know, let's take the global 500 companies, largest companies, what do you think would be the percentage that fit into the good culture innovative bucket? Um, I think that, I don't know. The short answer is I don't know. But what I do know is um, the ones that are fun to work with are the one, because here's the issue that you'll face. If you're going to do this strategy and you're going to, you're going to put money in innovation into your company that's a you know, currently a traditional company, it requires you to cut deeper elsewhere. And that's a tough tension. But if, you're, if you have the right culture, it's invigorating. And I think that that is what you look for in companies. Companies that are willing to say, hey, yesterday, like when I, I can tell you, when I was at Bell, we had this crazy project where because we didn't know what access would work in the future when we built new developments we actually put more money in because we basically put a conduit all the way to the house so if later on i wanted to put fiber through i didn't have to dig out the street anymore i just had this kind of pressure pressure machine and poof i'd get a fiber and if i want another coax poof i get another i bought options that cost money though and we made the trade-off of saying no no all the regular stuff we used to do we're going to scrap that. We're going to basically burn those bridges, and we're going to go for tomorrow. And if you have people that are willing to support you on that, um, so I would look for these companies that are, I think that many of them do that today. They have the courage to do it because they see. The other thing that you can do, obviously, is if you can show the prize, and if you can show the TAM, and if you can show that you, know, you can resource your sales force, and now instead of having three things in their bucket, they have nine things in their bucket. And there's nine things have high margin, and they're actually their tomorrow is the oxygen. I think that that is also a huge element of kind of winning in that space. And it's that's one of the things we're we're doing to help you as we discuss around the value framework um, is really giving data backed up by real customer case studies and Forrester to hopefully equip you with the tools you need to go to um, your, your leadership maker. and say like, look, this business case is is solid. Um, so let's transition a, li a little bit. You went from Bell, large incumbent, um, you know big kind of control over Canada, and then you went to a completely different environment thrown into Larry and Sergey uh, at Google. Um, talk about that change. Um, let me preface it by saying I am forever grateful for my time at Bell. I mean, I, uh, I was very proud to work at Bell Canada and still am today. People don't realize it, but there's a part of the utility that it's like oxygen. You take it for granted. Bell worked, and and uh, the the men and women that work at Bell, you just take it, it has to work, right? If if our stuff didn't work, the Bank of Canada wouldn't clear, right? I mean, you it's real shit, right? And so I think that with it comes this immense obligation that I've I've really got a lot of admiration. Having said that, going to Google was like going to Mars. <laughs> I mean, it, you go from. Like the essence of Bell is to be an assembler and a utility. The essence of Google is to be an innovator and a developer from scratch, right? You go from a place that where, you know, I don't know, a big portion of conversation is about how can you fit your budget and can you cut a little bit more here or can you tune here to a place where the question is, if I gave you eight times that money, what could you build? That's the question, right? You go from a place where um, it's all about the five nines to a place where snap, oh snap, oops, uh, <laughs> four or five. It's like, yeah, you know, we're trying. We'll be back. A completely different mindset. And then you go from a place where, you know, the good times are you're wearing a suit and you're going to a golf tournament 
to Shorts, Crocs, and Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, you're going from a place where, you know, you have the best engineers of Canada to you have the best scientists and engineers of the world on the whiteboard. It was a different place. So what was it like personally? I mean, so like going to Mars, going to Burning Man, wha what did you want Burning Man is awesome. <laughs> 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 Highly recommend it. Don't bring your kids. <laughs> 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 or if they're that high, it's okay. But in between, not so much. Uh, um, how was it? It was wonderful. It was wonderful because we were creating today's world that you all live in. It was wonderful because we were pushing technology. We had these really simple rules, like, and which made my job a lot easier. So as an example, early on, because of these 20% projects, everybody can go and fin go and do whatever they want on the weekends, or you're supposed to kind of go and scratch at stuff that you want to explore. Which, by the way, I have a great story for you. I get this box one day on a Monday morning. I come in on Monday morning, and I get this box, and I'm about to open it. It says, no, you have to sign the waiver first. I'll sign the waiver. Anyways, I open it, and it's a flashlight. But it's a flashlight that if you, if you look at it, you'll go blind. <laughs> and so it was a bet over a weekend that they could put, like, a 7 million lumens into, like, this big. And sure enough, the engineers figured it out over a weekend. So that's the spirit of the place. And... Hopefully no one looked at it. No, but I can tell you, I have it at Canuck, and I can see like a kilometer. <laughs> like, it is, <laughs> it is incredible. It's super dangerous. Like, don't do that at home. <laughs> um, and, but that was the spirit of the place. So that's, in essence, what you have is you have this place that basically says, one, um, and Eric was super instrumental. I'm forever grateful because as a CFO, you have these 20% projects. Everybody shows up and says, hey, I figured out a mousetrap. I need budget. I need this. I need that. And everybody wants their project to be funded. And we had a pile of cash. So in theory, you can fund everything. So, but uh, we had two, the real bottleneck was engineering. And so Eric and I had this long conversation. And we basically said, okay, here's the gig. We at Google solve big world problems and huge opportunities. So unless we have a product or a service that serves a minimum of a billion users, we won't touch it. That mindset, and it has to be technology driven. M imagine that you go to work in the morning and you're thinking, and you get these business cases, and people say, ah, I got this great idea, you know, Fruit Ninja something. And, um, or some map development, something like sp cool stuff. But you would run the numbers and you'd say, 200 million users. You're wasting my time. Get out of my office. <laughs> <laughs> and people would say, OK, I'll be back. And so if you think of the time I was at Google, YouTube, Chrome, Android, Maps, like apps, all of the products that we laid out and that we introduced to the world, Gmail, they're all about, they have the commonality. They're really changing people's lives and they serve a minimum of a billion users. And that was an extraordinary experience, personally, to be able to say, hey, let's make this happen. In addition to that, I, you know, I had all, I kept the title of CFO, but I had human resources, transport, uh, security, logistics, food, massage, uh, they basically said, just please, Patrick, make the place work. And um, so we had this unbelievable culture of, because we hired 2,000 people every 90 days. So I basically had the operating job of putting in service 40,000 square feet of real estate every Monday morning. Every Monday morning, whether I like it or not, I had to put 40,000 square feet somewhere. and. And we, uh, we had the third largest transport company in the North Bay Area, and, and so on. I mean, it was an extraordinary journey. It was super fun to work with these smart people. I've made friends for life, of course. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm forever again. I, I say I, I'm so lucky to have had these opportunities. I'm very grateful. But it was time. So that actually, at some point, you know, I've always, and I'm married to a lawyer, so I can't afford to divorce. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so uh, when she said, okay, it's enough, I was like, all right. <laughs> You've talked about leadership, and, and obviously you've worked with some incredible leaders in Eric, Larry, Sergey, George Cope, Jack now on the Twitter board. Yeah. These are, are pretty kind of uh, common names at this point. Do you see commonalities between them, or do you just see uh, total differences? But how would you describe like the, the leadership traits and the leaders that you admire? I, I think certainly if I look at the Google gang and the tech gang, like Jack and others that I, I'm around, which is very different than George, um, because of the nature of the businesses. Uh, they live in hyper-growth. They live in double-digit growth. They live in...